Hello, everyone. Hey, brothers and sisters, it's Taking It Down, and this week we got breakdowns and discussions on the first two episodes of Dark Matter from Apple TV+. Plus. And the movie that's now on Netflix, Butterfly in the Sky, it's a document of the famous PBS show Reading Rainbow, which gets us into a lot of different discussions about reading in general. So stick around for that. You know, it's eye-opening what you likely don't know about ladies in coaching and officiating in sports. And yeah, it's true that the Alabama Take features not one but two sports podcasts, but allow me to expand on the stare down. Hosted by Mallory McCormack, The Stare Down's a female-driven sports podcast that gives Mallory an opportunity to share some takes as well as some guests on the latest in sports, some results, but a lot of news. She brings a pointed point of view for female sports, and you get that sports fanatic who knows just as much, if not more, than her male counterparts. The Stare Down often gets deep into topics geared toward female sports, and well beyond in the sports world. Right now, she, Mallory's currently doing a multi-part series on coaching and officiating by women, which I mentioned, insightful things. You'll learn something. Visit the AlabamaTake.com or any podcast app to find it, The Stare Down. We at Taking It Down are so excited uh, for our next episode. It's number 200. I don't know how we got here. Well, we want you to be a part of it. Celebrate with us. Send us a question, or a, you can even record a voice message on the alabamatake.com. But send us a question in any format you want, any social media. You can send it straight to us with the alabamatake at gmail.com. If you'd rather use social media, just DM us. We will get to your question. Ask us anything about the podcast, about TV, about streaming, movies even. I want everyone who enjoys this podcast to send us a question. All right, what's going on? So I finished the Apple TV Plus show. Sugar caused a little controversy. I don't know if it caused controversy. It caused a little ripple in the TV world. Starred Colin Farrell doing one of his best roles to date as the private investigator John Sugar, who was hot on the heels of a missing girl in very noirish L.A. It's the series that garnered a huge and very rude spoiler from Catherine Van Arendonk on the Vulture website. It's also the series I lauded with the first episode or two. I cooled on it a little in the middle of its run, but I did believe two things, which critics disagree with me. The big event of Sugar didn't ru- really ruin it, but it also didn't change much, so that's that's a good and a bad thing. Uh, I just thought it was overall well done. It was interesting. I really did like the show. Had there been another actor playing John Sugar and it wasn't Colin Farrell, you know, I don't know that I would sing its praises as much. A lot of what I liked rested on Colin Farrell's shoulders, bringing this private eye to life and just giving us an absolutely genuine character, a very human character, someone you wanted to just watch. Very likable. When talking about Sugar in a text with co-host Donovan, I just asked him a series of questions. Do you like Colin Farrell? Do you like him in a well-tailored suit? Uh, Would you want to see him play in the nicest person imaginable? And what if that person was a private investigator in a very noir-like version of L.A.? Well, buddy, I got the show for you. So maybe that'll sell you on it. I'm interested to hear what you guys think because of the waves that it made. And I've also watched two or three more episodes of the Hulu series Under the Bridge since last I've mentioned it here. It's the drama based on the actual death of a high school student in Victoria, Canada, it doled out its mystery perhaps a little longer than needed. It'd likely be the same piece of television with one less episode, but I, it did allow you to kind of live with some of these people. It's hard to call them characters because they are, for the most part, real people other than one or two. My initial complaint was having the very real author here, played by Elvis's granddaughter, Riley Keough, felt unnecessary. They used her kind of as a plot point or a device throughout throughout these season because she wasn't actually there at the time of the event. I kind of griped about the way she was handling the character at first. It felt like a lot of moping, but the, I come around her performance. Riley Keough does get much better, and the idea of her being in there, the the author as a character being there during the investigation comes to fruition. I get its intention. Still kind of sits an odd choice even towards the end, but it, you know, I see what, what they're doing. 
The show, though, does get more and more captivating with each and every episode. I may barely spoil, spoil one part of an episode here. Under the Bridge and its creators does this really careful, considerate job of allowing us to know Rena, the victim, perhaps better than other shows of this genre. And it links us to these people. So the low-key spoiler is that uh, one episode spends a lot of time with the background of her parents. It's actually not a bad episode either. It does take the eye off the ball just a little, but it's still a good episode. The penultimate episode from last week, though, there's this heartbreaking moment where the father asks what kids are saying about his daughter. The finale is set to air today, if you're listening on Tuesday. I can recommend this one, though. It's a good one. Let's bring in the co-host here. Let's get Adam and Donovan. I will better take projection. Joining me now, it's Adam and Donovan. We don't have to spend hardly any time on this at all, but I do want to ask y'all to begin. How did you two celebrate the most important day of the year? Bob Dylan turned 83 on Thursday. I read a stereo gum uh, thing that stereo gum shared where Charlie Brown's being told by Linus that Bob Dylan will turn 30, and it's the most depressing thing he's ever heard. That's a classic. And then I drank myself to sleep. <laughs> Adam, I imagine you picked up the guitar, played a little times they are changing. <laughs> I just, him being 83, what, what do you make of that, Blaine? A, a lot. There's a lot of directions to go with that. I, I'm just surprised he's, you know, he had to have done his fair amount of drugs and drinking. Sure. And and he's with us and seems to be healthy. He certainly tours up, um, like a healthy person. You are probably <laughs> much more familiar with his biography than I am. I've read, read the book. I've read articles here and there. But, mm-hmm. you know, his his personal life seems pretty outside the public view. Do you think that has something to do with it? That he has not really been a celebrity conventionally in many, many years? And when he goes home, is he is he living a pretty quiet life, stress-free? I think he just stays busy. I think there's something to be said about a person who stays busy. There's this great line in Heartworn Highways, not even spoken by one of the stars. Uh, It's Towns Van Zandt's neighbor, old black guy, and they ask him, you know, how how have you made it so long? Because he must be pretty old. And he says, always be doing something. Stay moving. I believe in that because, like, my grandparents – they were able to retire like fairly early just because they worked very hard and played their cards right. But they were like, we know exactly what we're going to do, you know? And like they always had something to do. Like even if it was just like we're going to go play golf with our friends, right? Like they are bu- they were busy. Keep something on the calendar. How exactly. Ma- how many exactly. times do you see someone retire and then die a year later? I'm just, um, thank yeah. God that Nick Saban has this job with ESPN. <laughs> <laughs> he could be, he could be. He could be giving up the ghost if not. I'm horrified. I don't know. Do you think, real question actually, do you think Miss Terry will allow Nick Saban to die? <laughs> he will have to check in on that. Yeah. One, sure. Last, we'll shift gears. I don't have a good segue here, but. Oh, I can tell my real answer for what I was doing for Bob Dylan's birthday. Go ahead. So I went to trivia, and I the whole time I was super afraid that there was going to be like a Blaine level Bob Dylan question. Was there? No, thank God. Uh, was there any at all? No, not a bit. Missed opportunity. Were you afraid because you're part of a team and you you thought that they may look to you? Yes, because last time I did it, we got first place, and they keep saying it was because of me, which is not true. But you hype me up like this, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna get some anxiety. What was the question that that gave you this ringer status? Uh, I was able to re- put some Roman emperors in order. <laughs> Damn. So Bob Dylan is your Roman Empire. Yeah, Cal- okay. it was Caligula, Vespasian, and, and Marcus Aurelius. Those are pretty Marcus easy to do. Aurelius. I was hoping you would say him. I'm, I'm reading a little. <laughs> I'm reading a little of his work. Last week, speaking of what's good for me, last week I hailed Dark Matter as a really entertaining first three episodes of TV on Apple TV Plus, and it's since aired its fourth episode called The Corridor. We won't get that far. Uh, it's based on the book of the same name by Blake Crouch, who also wrote the TV series. He's heavily involved. This 
This makes me interested in it because I do I do think he's actually savvy, a savvy writer. Seems to be. Yeah. And I praised the show for a few things, but namely just the premise drew me. I was enthralled by that idea. Adam, you've since watched the first episode. Excuse me, the first two. I'm glad you did because they came out as a pair, and I'm curious if that was needed or or, or uh, does that play a role. So we can talk a little about the first two episodes. So uh, we'll, we'll put a little spoiler warning up for episodes one and two. There are four total, so maybe we can all catch up at some point and talk more of Dark Matter if Adam likes it. Uh, what do you think, Adam, just overall? Yeah, should we do the, you the pre-spoiler recommend or not? Yeah. yeah. Let's do that before we do any spoilers. Yeah, because last week I was all in. Where are you? I'm, I'm pretty into it, and I need to... It reminded me what we said on this program before, that Apple TV seems to be the HBO of the moment, and that they just make good stuff. And yet again... This is good stuff. I thought the the acting is pretty superb. The story has been great so far. The the environment, the mood, it all feels fresh and but like it's hitting the beats of prestige television without without becoming a caricature of itself. If that makes sense, that does make sense. That's high praise because there's so much I mean, I, like oh sorry i was just thinking to like to go with adam's point like there's so much like good tv or it's quote unquote good tv that's like it's got a couple stars and it's not horribly written and it's like oh okay we've seen this <laughs> a million times or it just it just lays there on the screen yes. there's no life Michael. much <laughs> i think the the acting really elevates this and i could i could see how maybe i wouldn't be wild about the book then maybe the show is more literary than the book would be. Hmm. Donovan, did you give, out of four stars, what are you giving the book? You read the book, right? Out of four, uh, three probably for me, which, okay. which is not like maybe three and a half, but probably a solid oh, three okay. where, it, where it was like, oh, I this was enjoyable, but not like, like it didn't change my life. But it, right. like, yeah, like, re, like more read it than don't. Yeah, I thought you were more lukewarm than that for some reason. Uh, uh no like i didn't think it was like the greatest thing in the world but mm-hmm. it wasn't something that i was like yeah i could take it early you know like i it was like i don't regret reading this sometimes i feel like modern literature or maybe all literature and with time the stuff that doesn't hold up just fades away so we have the luxury of mm-hmm. <laughs> things being you know curated for us but can sometimes have a great premise and ask great questions, but not really deliver on the quality of writing, yeah. character development, whatever. And you end up with these big ideas that just feel like bullet points in a narrative. And it seems to me, through I've only seen the two episodes, but that this is doing a thing where it's asking and making you feel the question at the same time. You know, Donovan gave it praise enough by saying that it avoids what the Martian <laughs> and its writer yeah. had, which is just get just knee deep in the facts and just sound like a owner's manual. And right. I think Donovan, right. you mentioned that it, the book itself doesn't do that. No, it, 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 it is not. So like the, the, the Martian is a very, very annoying example of what is, you know, usually referred to as hard science fiction. And this is the right. kind of, you know, like even you have like, you can go back to like Robert Heinlein being like, yeah, me and my wife did, you know, math all over our floor to see if the asteroid orbit made sense. Who fucking cares? I mean, sometimes it's... I'm with you. That's me being an asshole. Sometimes it's cool. But sometimes I'm like, who fucking cares that you blew yourself up because of potatoes? I don't. And I, and also I hate I hate your tone of voice. Like something about that like, sn- mm. like snarky, too smart for you, too whatever. Like it's like you're not like I've met you and you're not fun and you're not funny. And I don't think that this does that at all we can get into specifics of the first two episodes now i think yeah we i i I really found the show propulsive in fact i'll say this about the fourth which is nothing at all it's the longest episode by far and i swear i when it ended i thought that was only 30 minutes of tv but it it was an hour runtime it's good uh just just entertaining propulsive the idea is big enough but also brought down to almost like an action movie kind of level. Here's the big idea, but let's just put it in 
uh, let's just give it a story. Yeah, absolutely. And they they dangle the the big ideas out there just enough that they're they're almost like through the first two episodes at least they are like an extra character or place would be if that makes sense instead of say, being say that again what did you that they're they're almost like an extra character or a setting or something the big ideas like you right. know you're existing in big theoretical questions and big sciencey stuff happens and there are binders that are opened and answers are looked for but what you feel is more a romantic relationship, jealousy between friends, mm-hmm. a sense of place. You know, I was struck in the first episode, you know, right off the bat, he receives this job offer that could change their lives. And he says, well, our, our lives are here. The level of acting by everyone in that scene and writing too, and set design and all of these things work together that I really felt that, that someone is living in a place and a time that they are fully present for and so mm-hmm. when when these big questions start getting asked the the sense of dislocation is that much more profound that's really good well said that's really that's interesting because what... that really speaks to something that i've sometimes thought which is like like you take an oppenheimer and an einstein or whatever and they are thinking the big thoughts but at the same time they're com- like if you look at their biographies they're completely human right like no better or worse than any of us Right, right. And this one, I mean, I think the whole, I can't say, I, mean, I shouldn't say this only having seen two episodes in front of Blaine, who has seen everything that's available and Donovan, who's read the book, but it seems to be a question of what is, what is a life, what is home, mm-hmm. all these kind of things that are yeah. so, could be so trite mm-hmm. and so cliched in the wrong hands, but already through just a couple episodes, and I didn't realize they released at the same time, Blaine. Uh, mm-hmm. But it it just feels heavy and well earned. I'm shocked you could only limit yourself to two episodes because that second episode ends with that huge death. Yeah, which was murder, I should say. Shocking. Yeah, kind of uh, was <laughs> in a in an era when. You know, we praise Shogun, or I, at least I did over and over again, for not falling into the the Ned Stark reality or the House of Cards season two, you know, and he pushes her in front of the train after all the right. whatever. Obviously, there's a little, we're into spoilers here. There's some leeway because we're not actually actually losing a member of the cast here in many ways. Right. But yeah, She's still going to continue as the the normal wife in, the, in our world. Right. right. Jennifer but Connelly, by the way. What what a fun way to play with stakes that you don't lose a major star, yet violence is happening. That it, it's funny to say violence happening happening brutally, but I mean there was no negotiation. There was no like, here's why I'm here. It's you're in my way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bullet between the eyes. Let's go. Speaking of episode two, I really enjoyed the conversation that he has with the alternate versions of his friend and his wife though she's not his wife in this reality that was fantastic when they're sitting after the the gallery yeah smoking the jay yeah fantastic it was so good so fascinating like and again i mentioned this last week what what would the me who made this decision be doing right now what's he doing is he by the pool raking in the millions yeah passively (laughs) well and i i think it's doing a a fine job of making you wonder all of, you know, which which me is earning the most passive income, but also, <laughs> like, what would I do if I were put in this situation? You know, you yes. always, I think with these shows, you want to quickly understand the rules of what's happening and then try to, like, figure out how you would respond and then overrate your ability to do such a thing. You know, (laughs) like in reality, I'm probably also going to the hospital and finding out what's trying to find out what's wrong with me, not turning into like a superhero. It does remind me of that like tweet you shared with us. I think it was yesterday. The one that's like fantasy world. I would I would simply not carry the cursed item. Me like getting brain damage 23 hours a day from my phone. Right. Like what I do. (laughs) Right. Do you want to know the moment where I thought I would do better than the Joel Edgerton character of Jason? (laughs) What's I that? thought it was in episode one toward the end where he's getting kidnapped by himself, by the alternate version of himself. And I thought as a podcaster, 
I would recognize my own voice. <laughs> I'd be like, uh, you sound like me, masked but, stranger. Yeah, he had a mask on plane. I think 98% and a gun. of people won't, don't podcast, so. <laughs> yeah, I hear my voice a lot every week. So uh, I'm really glad you like it, though, because I was wondering if it was just me or if it truly was good, uh, you know, because I'm so fascinated by the premise alone is that what's keeping me here but and i'm also i'm also a fan of joel edgerton and, and jennifer connelly so it, it seemed to check off many boxes for me personally and i didn't know if it would for either of y'all they have both been so good this has also led to this is completely out of nowhere but i'm so excited and i'm gonna get the name wrong to watch it comes at night after because it already looked interesting and then blaine you said it was awesome and joel edgerton was awesome in it. it and i'm like Sold. Okay, I didn't know how good it was going to be, but I'm I'm going to watch it. <laughs> yeah, that's a 2017 horror movie for those listening. He's just been so strong in this. Tough to to take your eyes off of him. You know, he's that's kind so of having true. one of those magnetic performances. Jennifer yeah, Conley he... has been great too, and I think her the way that she is playing the supremely confident, successful artist in one or was in one timeline and then the mother and the but the happy mother and the happy wife and the you know well, whatever she's doing in the other world curating gallery spaces or kind of more behind the scenes uh, you know she's mostly happy right because there's right. that moment where her lawyer asks her why are you, you know, running the why the, are you running the marathon the triathlon yeah. triathlon thank you yeah and she's like you know I just want to get out or whatever. And she's like, there's other ways of avoiding your family. Anyway, it's kind of a, a and that's a nice little moment of allusion to, hey, is, is she 100% happy, 90% happy? I really didn't appreciate all the strays that I caught as someone who enjoys running long distances <laughs> and, you know, as a musician with successful friends. Uh, say wondering more. what if. It's, it's great. I don't want to say more. <laughs> I did enough in my own brain while watching this program <laughs> that you forced me yeah, into viewing. At this point, Blaine, it's called rumination, and it's very unhealthy. Yeah. <laughs> what's the Adam doing who won the Grammy? Is that yeah. what we're saying? Is he, what's he doing? Probably Gardening. making, yeah, an extra $6 a year from streaming yeah. versus no. now. Hey. <laughs> I think we'll probably continue this one. I got I to gotta catch up, you know? Well, we're off next week, so you can. You think I'm not gonna? You think I'm not gonna waste my life? You think I'm gonna watch TV shows? No, I'm gonna be volunteering, wasting my life for charity. <laughs> Let's take a little break here, and on the other side, we're gonna talk about the n- documentary that came on Netflix this weekend called Butterfly in the Sky. Yeah, we're going to shift gears into the documentary, which just appeared on Netflix this weekend, Butterfly in the Sky, the story of Reading Rainbow. It's a 2022 movie, but it's only now on the Netflix. Now, I went into it thinking it was brand new and made for this streamer. Me too, actually, until you literally just said that. See, I, yeah. It was, I, uh, I assumed it was a Netflix movie. It wasn't until I was finished watching it that I didn't know it wasn't. So, uh, But yes, directed by Bradford Thomason and uh, Brett Wickham. Whitcomb, excuse me, and chronicles the journey of the PBS show Reading Rainbow from inception to ending. There's nothing really to spoil here, but if you want to go into the documentary knowing nothing, you will learn a few things and Mm -hmm. do it. You know, I can recommend it, Donovan. I would recommend it. I would say that as a documentary, if you do not have the emotional attachment of watching Reading Rainbow as a child, it might not do that much for you. Like, it's sort of interesting in the abstract, but I really, the the notes that were working for me were the, like, I've seen this, right? Uh-huh. It's not like a, like, it's not like a Frederick Wiseman documentary, right? Where you're like, I know absolutely nothing about how the New York Public Library works, and he's going to show me three hours of it, and it's going to be fascinating. This is, this is more like, if you don't have that touchstone, I don't know. Well... Uh... Uh, but, before, but yes, thumbs up. Sorry. Recommendation. Sure. No, I, yeah. <laughs> but before we get into any specifics of the film, I, let me just say this if you're on the fence. It's comforting, it's well done, and it does not overstay its welcome. It tells the story and then just moves on. I would agree with that. It's less than an hour and a half by yeah. about three or four minutes. And uh, I think that helps to make it perfectly pleasant. This sounds like damning with faint praise, and I don't mean it that way, but like... 
It doesn't pound something into your head over and over. No, it doesn't. It just tells the story, and that's it. Well, that's not true. What it pounded into my head is that reading is for nerds <laughs> and the rightfully bullied. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got me. <laughs> rightfully bullied. No, yeah, surely, right? That's all of us. We all watch Reading Rainbow. Am I right about this? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. So to, to to speak for the, like, if you have that emotional attachment, it'll be fun. Like, I haven't watched Reading Rainbow, you know, since, like, the 90s. But, like, there was stuff that's, like, I remember, like, the intro, like, with the dragon. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Or, like, the star. They, so they, they show the, the Star Trek episode with LeVar Burton. Which which was like very revolutionary to me at the time. Like, wait, he's on Reading Rainbow, but he's also on this TV show. Like, Dad, can you explain this to me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was probably like five or six, <laughs> but I now, remember that episode. So mm-hmm. that was kind of fun, right? Like, oh yeah, I remember that. It, it really pushes a lot of nostalgia buttons. Absolutely. I can remember so much related to the show. I remember going to my grandmother's house and watching it every morning during the summer, and my aunt came by one morning and she made a very harsh criticism that you've already watched this kids will just watch anything over and over and as an adult I now see I now experience the same thing but I don't <laughs> point it out like I might yeah. I'll be thinking uh to my I'll be thinking about my daughter man she's watched this like five times in a row so yeah. I, just, I just leave it be because I remember that just hurt my feelings so much. Like, but it's good. I appreciate that my thoughts. So when I was two or three years old, apparently I wanted to watch Bambi every morning. But I would all Jesus like, Christ. Yeah, but if you is if that you what's remember, wrong with you? If you remember, uh, they're like there's a bit with a rainstorm, and then when Bambi's mother is dead, and that really scared me. So like my dad would put it in and like fall asleep on the sofa, and then like wouldn't know to wake up in time uh-huh. to like settle me down. But, like, I appreciate that he wasn't, like, when I was four, like, you fucking kid. Like, he, like, oh, you waited yeah. until I was an adult. Oh, that's your like, point. You loved it. <laughs> over and over. And I suffered. When reading Rainbow, I was always so sad that it was a repeat. But I would watch <laughs> it, you know. And I, But I was just like, I was also doubly sad that I couldn't find the books in my library because we did not have a bookstore in where I lived. And library and library only. And I would think, but they don't have that book. We don't have where the wild things are. We only have the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Even that's illegal now. Yeah. It does make me wonder, where do we meet kids now? Like, they talk about we had to meet them where they were, and they were sitting in front of the TV during the summers. We meet them in Bluey. We, do we? Absolutely. I think kids it's YouTube Blue- and TikTok. Kid, kids love Bluey. Yeah, that too. Or Roblox. And video games, that's right. You know, the the YouTube and TikTok do have their reading niches right but there's also this strange toxicity that's with the book talk have you are you you're familiar with this right a little while i was sitting watching this movie or sorry documentary i was thinking like wow i hate this so much less than i hate the very idea of book talk yes (laughs) did reading rainbow influence you to be a librarian media specialist that you are now can you pinpoint that no, I can't necessarily pinpoint that, but I do think, which it's not what I do now, but I think when I originally went into the program, I thought it would be really cool to be like a children's librarian because of everything they express in Reading Rainbow. Like, I think that's just so important and informative and powerful. One of my favorite moments in the doc was the creation of the theme song. Yeah, that, I like that too. I had no idea was that involved. Adam, if you only get a chance to watch a little of this you should definitely catch the guy recreating the theme song on in his uh studio there do they do like a classic albums like a like a five minute version yeah yeah isolated tracks yeah yes get everything yes. out on the yeah, board he builds yes. it he builds Amazing. it and i'm like no it did not and he's like we're almost there and it's like wait there's more <laughs> Uh, I'm also happy they brought in the funding for PBS and how that's still an issue. It always is going to be an issue. S- sit, sitting and watching this, I was like, please, please edit this out if you think I'll get canceled. But like, goddamn Republicans. Say more. Going after Re- Newt, Newt Gingrich. George, you, you know, like they're Newt Gingrich. Like, like just it's like the same. This is me on a little bit of a soapbox because it's hitting libraries. But like, it's the same rather. Oh, it's so anti-family. Po- point to it. 
Point exactly. to it, please. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, no child left behind. Like, like Blaine, I'm sure you see this, but like my I was going to my about. wife is a uh, college writing professor, and she's like the the years like it, basically as soon as it switched to nothing but, I noticed a difference in writing, and not a good one. And it's like, of course, like it, and and you just like this is just continued, right? Like you've just destroyed any lo- like yeah, you can't quantify love of reading. Screw you. Yeah. yeah. It's just terrible. And 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 to be fair, like there are a lot of um, technocratic Democrats that think this way too, where if everything's not measurable, uh, then it's not real. Back then, maybe more so with Newt Gingrich, speaking of him, back during right. his day, it was a lot more of funding. Like, well, we just, if we can just trim this budget right here, we, and we don't need this. You know, I think we've even seen that, right? Like in like the Trump era and, and stuff that's, um, and I think they're laying the groundwork for that with the possible Trump presidency. Everything like NPR, it's just this liberal, you know, uh, what's his face? Not Barry Weiss. The guy that wrote the op-ed about, oh, it's so liberal. It's like, okay, guy, come on. <laughs> right? It's, it's just laying the foundation for further degradation. of. Or I remember, you know, when I lived in Alabama, uh, the year that PBS funding uh, in Alabama became less neutral, right? Became more the programs that could be on there were more according to the whims of the governance in Alabama. You know, it's just, it's the same, everything, everything old is new again. The documentary weaves through some various emotions, I thought, really well. mm mm-hmm. uh, How it, when it tracked the joy of beginning versus this oppositional yeah. funding, you know, what do we do now? Uh, but I, I'm like you, I, I was appreciative that it included... This shift into testing from No Child Left Behind, which still reverberates, it's it's just testing, testing constantly. I see it in my own child who's only in yeah. first grade. I see it just with kids, who, well, young adults, because um, they're not kids anymore when they get to me. But just like they, some not all, and, and by no means all of them, and by no means am I blaming the students because my students are uh, really exceptional. But a lot of them just really struggle with things like, you know, like they can like remember the little bit. But if you ask them like, mm. okay, like put out these dates in history and how they relate to each other, it's like, huh? Uh. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or even like re- reading is very, very difficult. Reading and extracting a point to take out and apply it can be very, very difficult to them because it's not what they've been trained for, you know, and all of a sudden they're in college and a professor is saying, Hey, check out some scientific literature. And it's just like, it's light years beyond what they've done or away from They're They're more like different genres, but it's, it's tough. And that's a direct result from testing, testing, pick the right answer. But also I think that, uh, teachers, and I'm speaking to myself, you can squeeze in sometimes some inferential type thinking and connection making but the the questions the questions aren't just recall. Yeah, uh, it's a matter of getting away from just that sort of recall kind of thinking. Yeah, and this is, this is a completely other soapbox. But I do think that this is the reason students come in. Well, I mean, one of the reasons because students do what they do for reasons that have been consistent across time. But like, I do think that because they've been given these little snippets and then like summarize it like pull out the main point now they come into college and they're like oh i can just use chat gpt for my my discussion board question right Mm -hmm. and it's like to any students listening all of your teachers and professors can tell and the reason they can tell is because it's not sufficient to the assignment it's just like it's bad it sucks it's not good yeah. But when you're all you've been taught to do is summarize a little snippet, I could see how you would be like, "This is adequate. Why do I need to think about this?" Yeah, that's a whole other soapbox. <laughs> Certainly tracks that the show originated with an educator. Yes, absolutely, and, and I like sense. I like that it's not only an educator but an educator <laughs> that was uh, like a reading educator. Yeah, someone who's like, "Oh, my my ideas work. I promise you." Hmm. Have you ever listened to, this is a little bit off the point, but I was thinking about, obviously this is, this documentary is somewhat of a hagiography of LeVar Burton, but that's, that's perfectly fine. 
Right. Uh, he's he so like, central. He seems like a nice dude, too, right? Yeah. Have you ever, but they talked about and they showed a little bit of his LeVar Burton Reads podcast. Have you ever listened to that? I never have. It's actually kind of great because he picks short stories that he loves mm-hmm. and reads them. And they are, like, it's everything from Elmore Leonard to Octavia Butler. And really? he is a good, like, he is a good reader and a good narrator. Mm-hmm. So if you, yeah, if you've got some time to kill. Also, the other nice thing about them is uh, uh, he will often select stories that are hard to find otherwise. Not always, but sometimes. Mm-hmm. You're just going to listen to him. Well, he's had the practice. He certainly has. We've talked about everything but the documentary, <laughs> it seems. But, you know, the documentary kind of speaks for itself. It does. You... Uh, like, my feelings on it was like, you know, like I did appreciate getting the, as an adult, like the behind the scenes look to what they did for kids, especially like, and stuff I didn't remember too, right? Like, we're like talking about homelessness. I, I, I wasn't watching it by the time they tackled 9 um, 11. You know, no, you, you were even... there. You were in the shit. Was, you were in the shit? One of my questions for y'all was going to be, what year did they stop making it? And I am shocked that they covered 9-11. Yeah, they went to the... So in the documentary, they covered this, but they decided to go to the, the public school that was closest to Ground Zero, which had actually been closed because of the you know the environmental effects of, of massive buildings falling down and catching on fire and all that. Uh, and talk to the kids about what their experiences of that day was like. And then the aftermath, too. Which was really, you know, I mean, it did, like, they, 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 they put a little Mr. Rogers in here. And it really did remind me of, like, Mr. Rogers coming, you know, like, battling cancer, coming back to talk directly to kids. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do think one of the things that I really loved about this, and I think is in tune with the show, is that um, it does not talk down to children. And in fact, like, like I'd forgotten about like those, the book reviews, right? But like, they just let kids like talk about, like, hey, like be completely weird kids. Yeah. And say, hey, here's what I liked about this book. And like, it's so, like, it's so, like, maybe not 100%, but it's so rare to find something that's educational, but not didactic. Right. Where like, they're not, like the kids are not like, except for like the broad love of reading, right? Like the kids are not being forced to come to any conclusion, you know, it's just like, hey, worms eat bats in this cave. Isn't that awesome? You know, yeah, like, there's no, you know, there's nothing. <laughs> and so many books are evergreen. So I could sit my daughter down and, and I think she'd still dig all these episodes of Reading Rainbow, if not, yeah. you know, the majority of them, I suppose. I think that that is another, like, the documentary didn't speak to it, but kind of an unspoken thing. It's like they were really on a streak. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, you as a kid, right? Like, if you ever encountered, like, that reading rainbow sign on a book, you're like, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> the Oprah's book club of the children's exactly. world. Oh, yeah. For, for, for six-year-olds. <laughs> it totally was. Uh, it's, it was funny to me, just a personal little thing. When I started watching it and they said, well, we wanted LeVar Burton, but he was a huge star. And I thought to myself, wait, was he? And then they go, he was in Roots. And I go, oh, shit, he was in Roots. Like, literally the biggest thing that... Yeah. Like that I, year. How could I forget that? Yeah, I, I just assumed he started with reading Rainbow, but I'm a dunce. He was like 18 when he was in Roots. He was... Yeah. I It's it's funny because I both knew... I, I simultaneously knew him from reading Rainbow and then my dad watching The Next Generation, which led to like this like mind freak of like, reading Rainbow is on the set. I don't understand that. <laughs> the episode with the guy... Who did the theme song? Yeah. I, I can remember watching that one. There were a couple. I, I did like that. Like I, I mentioned a couple, but there were a couple that were like, oh, I remember that. Yeah. I watched that. Talk to me about reading today. Do, and I'll, I'll chime in with this one anecdote. Is that people still read, like, like students still read, believe it or not. It's not mm-hmm. Desolation Row out there. It, I still see a lot of students walk around with books. Mm-hmm true like that i see personally now that's anecdotal but so what do you do to get kids to be interested in reading pay them. it's still probably not enough right <laughs> what'd you say donovan i said pay them <laughs> that is a million dollar question right because i was even just reading a article about how like literally just having your phone not being on it but just having your phone while you're reading takes seems to take a bit of our attention away from what we're reading. 
that's it's tough, true. right? Like reading is not something that like we evolved for. Whereas like looking at like other people and mm-hmm. being having like novel stimuli, like yes, we evolved for that. We're seeking that out. I don't really know how you make a kid love reading. Some of these teachers out here are doing something right because like my my uh, my boss's kid, she loves reading so much so like right, like, she's like how old is she? she? This happened when she was nine. She's ten now. Uh, I was reading Under the Volcano by Malcolm Lowry, which I didn't enjoy. Uh, and she was reading... <laughs> Donovan just goes ahead and throws the author under the bus real yeah. quick. Yeah, he's fine. It's basically the only thing he read. He was an old drunk. But uh, she was reading... Have you seen, like, these, like, Warriors books? You know, they're, like... they're like, I think they're, like, like cats and dogs that can talk. Does that... What, it doesn't matter. But she comes up to me, <laughs> and she's like, what are you reading? I'm like, oh, it's it's uh, it's uh, Malcolm Lowry's Under the Volcano. It's uh, one day in the life of a British consul in a in a Mexican town. She's like, does it have violence in it? <laughs> I'm like, no, uh, not really. She's like, I only like books with violence in it. So mm-hmm. like teach, something's going right, right? Like she loves to read and she knows what she likes. Yeah. But man, oh man, I, like, I, you know, how do you like, how do you beat the iPad? <laughs> yeah. Well, my daughter likes reading. Good for her. Still, she's, uh, still she's, kids out there. We, she's six still, right? Is mm-hmm. she really, yeah. Mm-hmm. She can read uh, short little books by herself, like oh, the, wow. the, the Mo Williams books. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like Elephant. the pigeon and stuff. Oh, man. She loves those. I buy her one of those probably once a week, it seems like. That's awesome. Do you remember what where your love for reading began? Yeah. My, you know, reading Rainbow might be on the right track. My dad mm-hmm. read to me when I was, mm-hmm. I can remember being like, uh, like before bed, right? And I can remember being probably four, maybe five, and he read The Hobbit to me. And I just thought over success wow. nights. And I just thought it was great. And like he loved it, right? So you pick up some of that, right? Like it's like it's your dad. It's something mm-hmm. he loves. It's mm-hmm. something you love, you know? Hmm. And so just from that, uh, I just like fell in. And, and like also like a lot of the stuff that my dad liked as a kid, I also liked. So he would recommend things to me. And I was like, yes, actually, I do like this. And I, I, I also started reading fairly early. I, I think yeah. like I didn't. Like, I was still at the stage where I would, like, watch Sesame Street, but when, yeah. by the time I was, like, when I started first grade, I was reading little chapter books, and by the end of sixth grade, I could read, like, like the Chronicles of Narnia, you know, like a, a simple novel. And Adam, you were beaten into reading, right? <laughs> <laughs> Morgan Morrow took a belt to you every time. Pretty much. No, it was the same as, as what Donovan described. I mean, I don't, it has been so much a part of my life that I don't remember the details of it not existing meaning mm-hmm. that's a that's a very harper lee quote there Same. adam is it yeah where scout says uh readings like breathing i wouldn't you know you don't notice it until it's gone away or something like that yeah and i think it's having stories read to me both age appropriate and not there's a <laughs> donovan talked about being read the hobbit apparently yes. my dad taught or told me the my dad uh, did not read word for word, but decided it would be appropriate to tell me the story of For Whom the Bell Tolls. <laughs> and and young three-year-old Adam. And, and that was what When the Earth Moved means, Right, Adam. right. <laughs> I thought it was bad writing then in an otherwise great novel, and I stand by that opinion today. Yeah, but, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Like, excise that. Not yeah. because it's sex, because it sucks. <laughs> mm. But, you know, like, I, well, I was just going to say, I think particularly being from a this is not something people brag about anymore i guess but uh in in the good sense of the word a very southern family and by that i mean when they all lived in the same town it was a lot of meals Mm -hmm. shared and the same stories got told over and over again so that i was almost born into like needing to learn this family mythology that almost went hand in hand with reading if that makes like Hmm. stories are very important i can't i can't ever think of a time where that wasn't true and you know things like reading rainbow and whatever just kind of expanded the the scope of what what was out there i do think too another thing for me i was just thinking this as adam said it but like i had good models like my Mm -hmm. dad read like even to the point where like if i was in the tub he would be reading something like he was keeping an eye on me i didn't drown right and and like he was he was good right like he wasn't just ignoring me like i'd be like what are you reading and he'd tell you know like he'd tell me Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think just like that kind of model really, and then like my mom helped me, uh, she took an interest in like 
developing like early literacy and this was before like phonics education had completely gone out the room right window right so she helped me like sound words out and you know so that was i think having two models like that was was really big i'll wrap with two related stories i did not have models which was... i was curious i was i was actually kind of curious about yeah your story blaine well no one read books in my house no adult mm -hmm. <clears throat> They didn't have time or energy, probably. Uh, mm -hmm. But my grandfather would buy me endless amounts of comic books. Like, I could go, and he would buy five at a, at a time. And people, I can recall people asking him, maybe why? Or he would always comment to the cash register. He said, he would say, this this boy loves to read, and as long as he's reading, I'll buy him whatever he wants. Whatever <laughs> he wants awesome. to read. And it, but it was comic books, so it was questionable on, like, is this good? And I think that that triggered me to picture what I'm reading so that when I did get into things that weren't comic-related or, you know, school, I could picture what was going on in the text, yeah. and that helps me still to this day. But the second part of this, which is just depressingly sad, he couldn't read. Oh, wow. And good, he, Man, um, that's so awesome that he, like, did that for you. Oh, yeah. He was, uh, I can remember him telling me over and over, get all the education you can because nobody will take that away from you. Yeah. And things like that. Uh, just big statements like that. But he couldn't read. Now, this is where it gets incredibly sad. So get, grab your Kleenex. I didn't know that. Uh -huh. And I would take books to him, picture books, whatever, you know, where the wild things are, take your pick. And I'd take them to him and I'd say, hey, let's read this or you read this to me. And he, he just went by the pictures. When so, did you realize that? Pretty pretty quick. Because, pretty quickly after I could read, because I realized, right. that, man, he's having a lot of trouble sounding that word out. I don't think he can that, read. That's certainly bittersweet, because he must have just loved... Like, what I hear is, like, he must have just loved you an awful lot, even to, sure. like, expose himself to, like, you figuring out he couldn't read, but wanting to read books yeah. with you. Like, that's very... The sweet. same common thread of important adults for all of us. Mm -hmm turning mm -hmm. reading into the model. Like a very noble pursuit you know like mm -hmm. this is the a life worth living includes this this is mm -hmm. higher than what your your immediate day-to-day -day is ideas matter that sort of thing yes yeah for sure i agree that's how that's how we're here <laughs> uh, on this podcast unfortunately ideas <laughs> <laughs> yeah before we say goodbye another reminder that we are off next week but uh pin your question and send it to the alabama take at gmail.com or uh hit us up on any social media and, and send us a question if you'd like for us to answer a question for you in episode 200 wow for adam and donovan i'm blaine and this has been great we'll talk to y'all in two weeks <laughs>